Okay, so I can hear a light. Uh, hello, everyone. Hello. And uh, welcome to this uh, discussion panel hosted by Beirut AI for the, as part of the AI weekend. And today we have with us three Lebanese leaders uh, and technology experts who are creating an impact every day in their field. They will be sharing with us how AI is implemented in the cultures and the products of their companies. I would like to briefly introduce our speakers. Um, first, we have with us uh, Rudy Shoshani. And Rudy is a technology strategist in governance and cybersecurity for digital transformation with 21 years of experience in financial sector. He was awarded the executive leadership by PwC and selected as the top 50 global thought leader and influencer. He's also a moderator and a host uh, of the show DX Talks. And he's also a coach and a mentor for various startups and hackathons. So, so uh, thank you for, for being here with us, Rudy. We're very happy to have you today. Likewise, likewise. Thank you. Uh, we also have with us Rani Haddad. Uh, Rani is a technologist with diverse experience in IT, cybersecurity, and digital transformation. He's a platform and community builder. He co-founded Acton Technologies, a cybersecurity company which is headquartered in Dubai. Rani, hello, and welcome in this discussion panel. Thank you. Thank you a lot. I'm very, very excited to be here. Thank you. And uh, we also have with us today Mohamed Bisrouji, who is a multi-awards winner and a technology professional with a diverse experience in managing large projects and delivering cutting-edge technologies and software solutions. And Mohamed is a co-founder and CEO of an Irish technology company named Strafe which is focused on developing advanced AI-enabled business, uh, digital business flows for governmental, financial, and insurance companies. We are very happy to have you with us, Hamad. So thank you. Thank you. The pleasure is mine. Thank you yeah. so much. The pleasure is mine. Thank you. So we're, I'm excited personally. I hope you are excited as I am for this uh, discussion panel and interesting AI discussion. I would also like to thank our audience who tuned in today for this uh, discussion panel. Um, also, I would encourage the audience to post their questions over the chat, um, like all the questions during the discussion, and we will try as much as possible to answer uh, all of them if we can. So let's get started. Um, so I'm going to start with, um, with a question that's addressed to all uh, the panelists. Um, I would like to ask you, like, how are you applying artificial intelligence in your business uh, or in your work or startups? So we would like to see how you're applying AI and we can possibly start with Rudy. Yes, thank you for that uh, question. Uh, you know, applying AI is, as you know, it's, AI is, is not something new. Uh, we all live in AI. We don't know we are living in AI. Uh, we all use AI on a daily basis. Um, somehow in between me and you, there's many AIs, uh, you know, being implemented. Uh, because, you know, the way nature of work that I do, I don't really develop, I don't uh, work on, you know, developing algorithms and so on, but I utilize AI part of my daily work. And especially for, you know, the databases or the customer, especially, you know, when you say databases, it's too technical term, but when you say for the customer experience or for the customer relationship and so on, this is where I have the benefit uh, of utilizing such uh, AI technology and uh, benefiting from it on a daily basis. And for me, you know, I'm one of my I'm mentor, coach, and consultant. And of course, I run my own show, uh, which was which talk about uh, digital transformation. Uh, all of this, you know, it's not tangible in terms of, uh, you know, having a product or so on. So my utilization is more on the connection with the clients or the connection with uh, the participants, the connection of the people, how, you know, I manage this on daily basis, how I, you know, uh, have algorithms created in that uh, CRM system that which I utilize and which is an advanced version of it. You know, there's many CRMs that are available uh, worldwide, but not many of them, you know, utilize such technologies. So uh, you feed in uh, to try to really connect the dots. This is very, 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 very keen problem. It's actually connecting those dots where humanly we cannot. Once you give data and the more data you give, you start 
benefiting from that AI. And then from every day's experience and every day's technology and every day's work, you enhance the data, you enhance the feed where you are able to give more data so that those algorithms can really, uh, you know, uh, fine tune and work better to really try to achieve uh, more accuracy or more uh, algorithms to try to do matching and so on and so on. So this is my daily use of, uh, you know, uh, AI technology. On top of, you know, we, we preach AI on daily basis. <laughs> we, uh, we give AI concepts and so on, but the, as far as utilization, it's around this topic. Nice. It's actually interesting um, also to, to see companies that are actually using AI and applying it in various uh, problems, not just uh, like uh, adopting the, the, just the idea or the title and uh, using different things. So it's cool that you are putting AI into good use cases. Thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you. Um, maybe now we can move to Rani, if you can please share how you're using AI in your company. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, so, you know, AI in, in, in our field, uh, if I wanna, you know, frame it in our, in our field is about creating, uh, you know, machines or intelligent machines that can simulate how humans think and you know how humans you know behave or react to certain conditions, and uh, you know machine learning and automation are a subset of, of AI uh, that allows computers to learn from you know inputting data, which you know are not expl explicitly programmed. Uh, so at Axon, you know we're a cybersecurity services company. We have a, a cybersecurity fusion center, and uh, what we do is we we use a technology stack that allows us to uh, leverage machine learning capabilities. And what we do is obviously these machine learning, we don't develop them, they are built into the products that we use. Uh, but we, what we do is we build automation on top of that uh, output from the machine learning uh, algorithms that are, uh, that are built in. So what this does in fact is assist our, uh, our team, our analyst team, and, and conducting triage on incidents that you know are coming up on 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 the system, uh, looking into common incidents, and most importantly, it, it helps them prioritize potential threats. So, and that you know threats that actually require human intervention. So, one of the biggest problems today in the, in our industry is just uh, fatigue, alert fatigue, uh, human fatigue, uh, analyst fatigue, because there's so much data, so many alerts just popping up everywhere, especially in you know. You know, large organizations, uh, you know, government institutions, they have so much data, you know, flowing around and, you know, technology will, will just generate so many alerts. So we, we kind of utilize, uh, machine learning to, to kind of learn, uh, what is normal in an environment and then only kind of escalate incidents that require real intervention instead of wasting an analyst, analyst's time, you know, looking into every single alert and then, and then, you know, uh, uh, making it impossible to 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 cover everything uh, you know these machine learning models are built into the tech uh, we also fine-tune them so we we also for each client we fine-tune you know we have the ability to fine-tune these models and uh, you know the automations we build on top uh, you know save analysts so much time you know we go into different you know applications we do different things we have capabilities where we you know, can find an alert and then automatically kind of block an IP, for example, or, or disable a, a device uh, without the need for human intervention. Uh, kind of, again, it's just triaging all these uh, alerts. So in, in what this does in summary is just, you know, reduces load on analysts uh, and makes it so much more efficient to run on 24 seven operation with you know, less people, less time, uh, less resources, basically. Yeah. Thank Thanks. you actually for mentioning that, Rani, because also, like, one of the main concerns of people is that uh, maybe with AI and data, we are replacing humans. But what you're saying is that now we have more time to focus on the important alerts or on the really valid data and then utilize the human brain and power for more important Correct. tasks. So. Correct. Correct. It's, it's, it's actually just... It's evolving the human role in, in that, you know, we, we usually, usually uh, secu like tier one security analysts, uh, they're usually the, uh, uh, there's a heavy load on them. And it, it's actually a big, a lot of people don't last in security operation centers because of the load that they get when they, when they enter into like a tier one 
role in a, in a security company. Uh, and this is kind of, you know, elevating their positions in a way where they only deal with tier two alerts. They're not dealing with tier one, you know, garbage alerts that they usually uh, mostly noise. So when you eliminate the noise, you're giving these analysts, you know, a, a more kind of uh, more important position. They feel that they're working on something that's you know, more relevant than just eliminating noise. Yeah, exactly. It's very important. And I'm going to get more into questions about details about some cybersecurity and AI questions. So, yeah, thank you so much for sharing these insights. You're welcome. Cool. Uh, maybe Mohammed, now you can share with us your work in AI. Sure. Um, uh, I've had the pleasure to be a part of research group for a while. So we've adopted AI, uh, not just implemented AI. So it became part of uh, every product or software solution or service that we wanted to offer uh, to have a flavor of AI where we can implement AI in. Um, something that I'm sure uh, many of you is familiar with, Maslah uh, Tajil Siyarat or TTVMA as we like to call it, uh, we've implemented AI in that. Uh, people do not see it. However, um, every inventory or prediction analysis for the inventory system that's deployed at the TTPMA in Lebanon uses AI models to predict when and where to order plates, when and where to order, uh, you know, uh, materials that are needed and when they are required to be transported to the different headquarters within Lebanon. Uh, this is just one of the implementations of AI that has been developed by resource group. Um, in resource group, we've also adopted AI for doing deep learning in order to classify uh, or detect fraud in documents. So more of a vision AI implementations because we deal with government uh, applications uh, and biometrics platform. Uh, in SRAFE, uh, currently we are working with natural language processing, which is a, another version of AI. And we're developing our own uh, intelligent specialist. Uh, we call her SIMA. And uh, SIMA actually uh, coordinates with people uh, over WhatsApp or any messaging platform uh, with the language that... Uh, you know, that person is communicating with it. So if it's English, it's English, or it's French, it's French, and so on and so forth, Arabic as well. And the idea behind it is to simulate the ability to complete transactions, whether they are insurance transactions or banking transactions, using bots or artificially intelligent, um, you know, natural language-powered uh, uh, specialists uh, that reside in the back end so that you don't have a lot of... Uh, support staff or a lot of humans in the back end doing, you know, redundant work that they don't want to do. Uh, and so uh, we're developing on that front a lot uh, uh, with uh, NLP uh, and models. But uh, as well in Strafe, uh, we're working on uh, doing the first credit scoring system uh, in Lebanon uh, for uh, analyzing uh, credit scores for people in order to re-kickstart the economy uh, with respect to providing people loans or, you know, doing insurance, whatever the, the end implementation is, we're developing the uh, machine learning required to come up with these scores. And it's extremely difficult because you do not have as much data or you don't have data period uh, with respect to uh, the Lebanese market or the MENA market in general, if you compare it to the States or if you compare it to Europe. Uh, but we're looking at intelligent ways of doing web scraping or uh, learning through peer systems uh, and recommendations and where people support people or endorse people and so build on credit scores of other people and other assets. Uh, and things of that sort. So uh, AI as well is heavily uh, in depth uh, in the solution we're building there. So quite a lot of solutions uh, when it comes to resource group and SRAFE uh, that are AI intensive, um, but uh, mostly in machine learning and deep learning uh, models. Nice, that's very interesting. And it's, uh, I like that you highlighted the fact that all these projects, like many of them are being applied in Lebanon and regardless that uh, all of maybe obstacles of the data availability and everything, but still very nice projects can come out of this. So I think uh, it um, inspires other people to do the same as well, which is very good. So thank you for sharing that. Okay, cool. 
then let's move on to my next question. Um, I would like also to ask you, uh, we can start with Rudy. So basically we have like always this uh, uh, two edge of the sword thing, dilemma and whatever technology. And with AI, um, or not with AI actually, with the advancement of several technologies like Internet of Things, like all of our data is online, especially now with the COVID. So everything is by obligation. It's online. A lot of data being transmitted and shared, which is something perfect for the AI because without data, we cannot do anything. But this also poses some security concerns, right? Because more data exchanged, more data interconnected. How ready are we from the cybersecurity perspective to this new technological uh, era of just uh, uh, data being available, connected, uh, artificial intelligence being used? Like, because I know that you all have background in cybersecurity, so I would like to see your perspective, like from the pros and cons uh, perspective. Yes, uh, thank you for that, Ala. And uh, what I love about this, uh, you know, panel, uh, each one of us is. Uh, we're joined into the cybersecurity world, but uh, most of us are also working on a different uh, project, different uh, use case. And the most important thing here is the use case, okay? Because AI, I think, without a use case or any technology today, all of these trendy names without a use case is really yeah. uh, just a trendy name. Definitely. So uh, let's go back to, the, to, to, that, to that question. Uh, uh, if you only see, you know, uh, it's not also the technology in terms of uh, hardware or so on and so on, and, uh, software. Uh, we also have to go into the technology of applications and what's happening in the world. If we go back just last week, one week from today, we've seen Facebook leak 500 million users. We've seen uh, LinkedIn also another 500 million users. Uh, we've seen uh, Clubhouse yesterday, they announced also uh, one point something uh, million users uh, data has been leaked. So really, you know, when you go online, it's about that risk. Do we need to accept that risk or not? Uh, Rani will understand it much, much, uh, you know, precisely because he works on uh, the cybersecurity front in, tar in terms of, you know, fighting those hackers, fighting those new algorithms. Because when he creates a new algorithm, there's a new algorithm that is actually fighting it from the other way around. And, and this goes all over. Okay. So it has to go back to the, yeah, it has to go back to that risk management that we really want. And, in the, in the, you know, in the beginning of 2000s, uh, companies were going online. So we had to ask, do we really want to go online or not? You know, not going online, there's a lot of opportunities that we lose. There's a lot of things that we lose. There's a risk. You know, we have to care. We have to take care. We have to manage. We have to try to protect as much as we can. But in the end of the day, you cannot not be online. So the same thing today with all of those technologies collect, collecting, you know, from your watch, which has an IoT and it has somehow uh, AI uh, built-in algorithm to your mobile, depending which brand you have, because now even my, you know, earphone has uh, an AI built-in chip. So all of this, you know, data and data. And then when you go to the social world, my fear is more on that social front, not just the, the IoT technologies. Uh, our lives, you know, you have to really understand and really be responsible of what do you put online and where do you put online and what, you know, uh, yeah. for myself, for example, Facebook and all of these applications, I'm only business oriented. I, uh, for the last 15 or actually for the last 10 years, uh, I have, you know, I stopped putting any family because it was a hype in the beginning. And then hmm, for me, I said, well, I'm giving a lot of data and I, it was, you know, uh, something that I was aware of, not many people. Now people think of, you know, uh, IoT can track you where you are. So you're giving all of these data, you know, you take photos, you take, so you really have to understand what are you giving versus what is, what what you are getting. Even when you, when we talk, because when we talk now, Facebook is free. Even if you pay money for Facebook, you're still going to be, you know, delivering all your data. So that's not going to change. So we really must understand what is privacy and how we need to protect ourselves. With the rise of IoT and AI, things are getting more complex and more, you know, bigger scale data collection and so on. And there's uh, different parts of admins uh, mistakes or management's mistakes or, you know, uh, breaches or even the code uh, itself is not the best you can get. So we really have to understand privacy is, it has to be privacy also from uh, built in. The, and the design of privacy, it has to be really thought of as companies we are talking here, not just the social media, 
you know, when you create something or when you design uh, architecture or when you design a software, you know, privacy has to be built in from A to Z, going to the backup, not just, you know, ending in the how it is working and so on. So you really have to dive into those uh, privacy uh, Today, you know, GDPR has been uh, on the forefront of uh, fighting the privacy world, especially with our social media, because suddenly we woke up, you know, they can control the world using our our data, which is a kind of, uh, you know, a fingerprint of what we love, what we don't love, where we are. All of these are compounded into a cultural behavior. And then, you know, people can understand more. So we really must, as human beings, as person, as a citizen, and, you know, as a company, as software developer, as a government, also they have to be aware, for for example, if we take Lebanon's case, uh, we have uh, low 81 over 2018. I, I wish they did not do the privacy part. That's a big debate. And, uh, you know, they just did it for uh, sad to try to get more money, with, but that 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 trial on the like, legislation side was really a failure. Uh, so you really have to cover it from different perspectives. It's not just about you know having the technology and uh, going from from that side. Thank you for insights, Rudy, and uh, I really like that you shared about also the GDPR and the laws. But I think in, in terms of AI, the laws are still kind of um, not very advanced. Because relatively AI is a new field and still, for example, if a self-driving car, let's say, if it, let's say it killed a person, then who's responsible? Is it the engineer? Is it the AI? Is it the... the There's a lot of, uh, you know, right, you are 100% right. And that's why they are trying to really uh, formalize it under a governance framework, the AI itself, not just, you know, the algorithms, not just the AI community or the technology they're gonna even go into the, the algorithms later on, and that's we are in the early front of of such uh, exactly. things. Exactly, but definitely, it's so much needed in in the near future. Thank you for sharing all of these insights, Rudy. And uh, moving to Rani, can you please uh, brief us on your thoughts on this? Yeah, uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of focus on some of the the technical aspects of this. So. I mean, this huge shift into cloud computing, uh, there's a lot of benefits, right? Uh, companies and, you know, uh, SaaS companies can, you know, leverage all this data and give you a better service, right? They can give you a better, you know, antivirus. They can give you a better uh, logging solution. They can give you a better everything just because they're, the data is now, they're storing it. They're being able to apply, you know, different uh, machine learning uh, data models on them to, to just basically better their service. Uh, but with this, you know, uh, comes some risks, uh, like Rudy mentioned, you know, all the different breaches that are happening, uh, which, you know, gives, you know, hackers access to this data, and then they can, you know, use it in different malicious ways. So in the, in the, in the case of, you know, Facebook and LinkedIn, it's just, you know, uh, information about each person, their email, their name. Uh, but it can become much more, uh, you know, severe when it's, you know, data that's a bit more, uh, uh, you know, fragile or data that's a bit more uh, important. Uh, and for example, you mentioned uh, IoT. So I'll just, you know, look at that use case, for example. Uh, you know, IoT is, you know, everything today. In every house, you probably have like, you know, 10 IoT devices sitting there and you don't know about them. So what's happening in the IoT world is, uh, you know, most of the manufacturers who are creating these devices, uh, they don't prioritize security, right? They create the device and, you know, cost is, is the most important aspect usually. Uh, so they develop, you know, the hardware and the software with cost in mind most of the times. So what ends up happening, they depend on the user being well educated enough to secure that device. And in most cases, that is not the case, right? Users don't know what to do with security. They, they plug and play, the, plug and play. Plug and play. They keep they keep the password. That's you know the default password. They don't yeah. change it. Like all these all these uh, cases you've heard about recently about you know someone accessing uh, a, a security camera in a house, talking to a kid uh, who has you know those baby monitors. It's all due to just you know the user just plugging in the device and not changing anything. And this is not the you know the, the fault is not of the users. The fault of whoever developed that baby monitor, not you know, guiding the user to change that password to 
you know, implement the password or force him to put a password. So IoT is a big problem uh, just because of that, that thing where, uh, uh, you know, just manufacturers are not prioritizing security. Uh, the cloud computing aspect is, is creating a whole shift in, in the industry of how you secure your network, right? So you cannot, you know, previously, uh, you know, you, like let's say, uh, you're, let's say Facebook, they can have, you know, protect the parameter of their network and, you know, they, they can be fine. Uh, now there's, you know, just everything's on, on the cloud. There's, you know, people are using different uh, places to host. There's AWS, there's Microsoft Azure, there's all these different. And honestly, there's, it's, it's a very complex environment and there's a lot of misconfigurations that happen. Most of these leaks that happen are due to either, you know, uh, uh, security personnel or admins that, you know, have, you know, not taken the appropriate steps to securing their, you know, admin role on these, on these systems or just misconfigurations of, of, of servers on online. Uh, you know, threat actors, they can just scan the internet for vulnerabilities and they can find one and then they can do what they want. So it's, it's created a, you know, a massive shift and uh, there's a whole new like cloud security, uh, uh, you know, gu guide to how, how to, how to actually implement this. So uh, it's, uh, I mean, we're, we're, I think it's the more we go towards, you know, data being everywhere and everything's online, uh, there's a race, you know, there's always a race for, you know, security companies to come in and, and try to, to, to help and, you know, keep, keep things uh, secure. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I agree with you. And I like that you highlighted that it's the responsibility also of the person or the company developing the code to maintain the security. Like it's not yeah. uh, the responsibility of the user just. Uh, no, they have to, I mean, you have to shift that there's a saying they say today you have to you have to shift security left so you shift security all the way to the you know pre-commit you know from initial writing of code that's where security needs to be prioritized uh, you don't develop the software develop the hardware and then you know try to you know go back and try to implement security measures you have to do it from the start push everything left try to you know uh, uh you know the, the what, what you call usually you used to have you know devops now you have you know, DevSecOps or SecDevOps, which implements, you know, security measures across the entire cycle of, you know, uh, continuous integration and continuous delivery of, of an application. Yeah, exactly. Thank you so much, Rani, for sharing these insights and highlighting also this perspective from the security story with AI. Uh, what about you, Muhammad? Do you have something to add in that regard? Sure, I'll, I'll just, um, you know, share my point of view uh, around the topic. Um, I think AI is a tool. Uh, again, it is a technology, it is a tool. Just like, uh, you know, uh, TNT was developed for mining and then was created uh, and used for bombing cities. At the end of the day, the technology itself can be used for good and can be used for harm. It's how we as humans decide to use it. Uh, and so, yes, uh, there are attacks that are being, you know, AI powered uh, throughout in cybersecurity and uh, in networks and other locations. But again, um, uh, AI is also benefiting a lot of our user experience online. And so uh, it's a double edged sword always. Um, and it's uh, up to us. But I think the major threat is not just privacy. The major threat of AI would be ethics. How do we ethically use AI? And how do we convince companies that own that data to ethically harness that data using AI? And this is the major problem that I think, you know, when you talk to, uh, you know, Instagram, Facebook, all these big platforms that have your data and that are using it without your knowledge most of the time or w with without your consent, um, you know, you've got Facebook creating uh, a lot of models. Um, they've even developed things for mental health as well, where they monitor uh, whether you're prone for, you know, committing suicide or not and, you know, send messages to intervene uh, without your knowledge or uh without you even knowing that you shared that much data that they could run these models. It's just about ethics. Uh, I think more than 
um, you know, uh, privacy because no matter how much data is being siphoned or through attacks, you know, you lose a lot of data, more harm is being done by the unethical use of approved data where, you know, data is being shared by everyone and uh, we do not really uh, think when we post something or when we share something or when, you know, we add a link that we are sharing all that info, but companies are harnessing this data, selling it to others. This is what concerns me uh, a bit more uh, at the current, you know, uh, condition of the market than, you know, uh, the problems of, uh, of leakage and security because leakage and security, it's a double-edged sword. AI will be used to, attack and AI will be used to defend, uh, as Rani said. And so it's it's an ongoing battle. But it, the battle in us and in companies is the harder battle to win, which is the battle of ethics. When will companies stop uh, and when it will not be beneficial to their monetary bottom line uh, to use all that data for their benefits? Yeah, exactly. I totally agree. And here it's tough because... Uh... Like by nature, humans can be greedy and if they have the opportunity to use all this data and gain a lot of money, basically data is the money now in this century. So here it's very critical. How much will they apply it? Exactly. Exactly. That's why. That's that's what concerns me in the field. Exactly. But at least uh, like we would like to raise the awareness of the community that even if we're not able to change decisions of big companies, but we as users can be aware and try as much as possible to protect our data. Definitely. It starts with you. I mean, reading and not clicking, uh, accept the terms and conditions and moving on <laughs> and understanding what you're sharing and what you're allowing. It starts there. Your consent, yeah. what you approve these companies to do with your data. And that's exactly. data that you own, by the way. This is your data, and this is something that you own. It is not the ownership of the company. You're providing them rights to use that data. And those, this data is not their ownership. This is something that people need to understand as well. Yeah, exactly. I totally agree. Thank you for raising also this awareness point of view, Hamad. Okay, that's good. Um, also now shifting a bit to shifting gears to a bit of a different uh, topic, I would like to ask, uh, like there are a lot of people, I know like now, especially now more cybersecurity jobs and opportunities will arise, especially when con like with AI, because AI is growing and definitely the security concerns are growing and especially in fields like healthcare, like uh, insurance companies, like security is a main concern. I don't think that companies would adopt AI if, they don't ensure the security of their clients in the first place. Um, so I think a lot of people would be interested to get into that field or as startups or as data scientists. So I would like to ask you if you have some feedback or advice on with, whether what, what degree to get, what certificates, what's the pathway, like from your experience and what you've seen, what, what worked and what didn't work, what do you advise? Uh, maybe we can start with Rania. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I mean, cybersecurity is is a, you know the expanding, ever growing industry and and field. Uh, there's you know people you can get into uh, creating applications, security applications, SaaS, uh, uh, you know, software as a service applications that you know can help businesses or people or end users, you know, secure uh, secure themselves. Uh, that's one entry point. The other entry point is going into more. Uh, you know, the IT side of it and, you know, IT security and be, being part of IT security teams. In both cases, I mean, uh, anyone can get into the field. You can just start, you just need to start learning, you know, have the capacity to learn. Uh, there's, you know, uh, as many, uh, you know, online resources as you want, both paid and free. So, I mean, it's just up to the person to kind of, you know, dig in, you know, go down the rabbit hole and, and, and work on it. Uh, once you, you know, get over that step and, and start learning, you can, you know, start with certifications. There's, uh, SANS has, you know, one of the, uh, you know, top certifications in the industry. They have certifications across, you know, defensive, offensive, uh, you know, uh, certifications in, you know, developing, uh, secure software. They have all kinds, uh, and there's, there's many more. 
because uh, that you know in the industry certifications kind of still give you that status that that you know expert uh, kind of label uh, I mean some people don't agree with that but I mean that that is how the industry is certification is a big thing uh, and honestly there's a huge talent gap you know you will always find a job in cybersecurity if you're if you're a skilled uh, cybersecurity uh, you know engineer or uh, consultant or, or developer or, or anything like that because there's a huge talent gap globally not even not just in the in the region there's a talent gap globally uh, lack of resources lack of skilled people uh, and we see it every day I mean in, in, at Axon we see it uh, in you know large organizations who have you know a 30 man IT team you know taking care of uh, you know a thousand uh, thousand end user uh, organization I mean it's just it's too overwhelming there's no way they can they have the time to to do anything, uh, you know. Uh, so uh, so yeah, I, I feel. I mean, anyone can get into it. Even I, I mean, there's. I'll give you an example. So we have a one of our uh, you know uh, penetration testing uh, or expert analysts that we have. Uh, he used to be actually an environmental engineer. Uh, he worked in on a oil rig uh, for like maybe five six years, and then he switched to cybersecurity and. He's one of our top guys now, and just he worked on it. He put his head down. He wasn't, you know, the youngest guy, and he was able to just, you know, learn, get certified, join Axon, and now he's, you know, just working on himself and and, and you know delivering uh, projects to our clients. So there's really no uh, nothing that can stop anyone. You're cutting, by the way. I can't hear you. You can hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, I was saying there is no like one way paved path. You have to find your path based on what you really want. Correct. You, where you are in life. Correct. Yeah. Okay, that's uh, that's. We can give you a one, so two, three guide, that... but that, that doesn't mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there, I mean, yeah. There's, there are so many ways. I mean, you can go down so many different paths. I mean, Microsoft alone has its own like, you know, uh, you know, maybe it will take you five years to complete all their kind of learning certifications. Yeah. It's just, it's just, you have to focus on something, uh, maybe something you like, maybe a certain, you know, uh, direction that, that you want to go down and just, you know, do all the, the learning required. You don't need to have a, you know, college degree or anything. It's everything's online now. You can just learn anything you want. Uh, again, a lot of it is free. A lot exactly. of it is free. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think this is the best part because now you don't really have, okay, the university degree is important, it's helpful, but also if you don't have a degree in the field, you can still learn and uh, upskill your uh, your skills if, if you have really the will Correct. for that. So I think it's a huge privilege for the generations. Yeah, cool. Um, okay, Rudy, I would like you also please to comment on that, especially from like, because I know that you've mentored companies and startups um so what's what's your comment on that regard like what's the best uh, path yes yes I, I will i will go into somehow in a path uh formulate a path because there's no one path again but i just want to you know to under, let understand first what are the trends uh today uh, that we really need to focus it's like you know in a, in a university usually you have to have an orientation what are the future jobs and uh we can do that uh, and here in cybersecurity. Uh, so cloud is, uh, you know, the trend and it's here to stay forever. It's not going anywhere. So you can focus on uh, that part, you know, cloud security, was it from uh, AWS or Azure or Google Cloud? These are the top three, you know, uh, cloud providers today. There's more, but this is the top three. So you can focus and they have a lot of wealth of training and most of them are for free because they want those adoption, you know, and they want those engineers to come and uh, be on that forefront. So this is one thing, you know, uh, on the uh, cybersecurity, there's, uh, sorry, not cybersecurity, on the AI, there's a lot of, you know, uh, specialization. Rani uh, has dived into this, you know, because it's not just algorithms or not just uh, uh, machine learning. It's also way beyond of this. It's understanding how data works. It's understanding the architecture and, and uh, and the other things also. 
uh, if we go on the IoT and 5G, you know, that's a full front that is upon us all. You know, the market of uh, IoT is in the seven trillion dollars, seven trillion. Let me repeat that: seven trillion dollars market wow. size. So there will be 70 billion, 70 billion devices by 2025. So these numbers are huge. So this is where, you know, I'm, I'm gonna be sharing the futuristic part of it. And this is where people should go today. That doesn't mean they should not traditional, should not specialize in the traditional things, but this is where the future is, is going. Now, uh, going back also to the shortage of, of skills, we are really in, the, in shortage of skills. If we just take one example for Europe, all right, there are 3 million demand for jobs for cybersecurity. The supply is only 2 million. So we are in shortage of 1 million immediate. Now, there's 1 million jobs in Europe, just Europe. I'm not just talking the world. So there's a lot of, you know, need. There's a lot of people where they want to have to focus on this. So and this my... I like uh, how much AI is creating for us jobs and not just killing jobs. If, if we are in the right path, AI, it's actually an opportunity. True. This is where you have to see AI as an opportunity, not as, you know... It, AI is only moving certain jobs. If you go back 50 or 60 years before the computer, really the computer age, okay, and they started in the, uh, being mass mass available for the public, you know, in the early 80s. But if you go a little bit before that, there was the typewriters at that time. So what happened to that person who was working on that typewriter? The job really didn't change, you know. Sorry, uh, wasn't really, it was thrown out and then he went home and then he had nothing to do. He adapted and he upskilled to possibly work in, in computers or work in something else. So jobs, jobs are really changing. And today the schooling system, which is very wrong, and the university system is uh, <laughs> as wrong as the schooling system. You know, you have graduates where they graduate, they don't know anything. I'm not, you know, uh, fighting because I know there's a lot of students here, but really if they give more about specializations and, you know, uh, I think the university, the, the students, they are giving more personal effort than what is the university actually giving them. And this is where uh, later on certificates are, are needed. Why do you still to have to, you, you know, you have been graduated and then why do you still need certificates? <laughs> so uh, otherwise, you know, you don't need university. So uh, the future is going that way. I've mentored a lot of uh, companies and I've mentored cybersecurity companies because this is one of my backgrounds and I was in the financial system for for a while. I understand exactly what's happening there. Uh, learn more about these uh, upcoming, you know, futuristic, uh, which we are, they are there, they are here today, but the skills are really lacking. Today, uh, if I have a project, you know, for me to collect skills from those that I mentioned is really a problem. So uh, we are, we are, it's an information age and data is for free and information is free. The internet is the best source. You know, go and put uh, labs. There's a lot of labs. There's a lot of, you know, uh, Kali Linux machines where you can just download it in a matter of a uh, couple of hours, depending on your internet. On 5G, it takes uh, less than one uh, minute. <laughs> Not doing advertising. Uh, the idea of it. Uh, and really explore, you know, learn, watch YouTube, read, uh, and try to see where you love, what you love, where do you want to, you know, head? Is it penetration testing? Is it, you know, architecture of security? Or is it on the forefront of, uh, you know, uh, this is where things are today. They are, everything is on the edge. Internet is open and adoption is opening worldwide. And there will be billions and billions more connected devices to be secured. If we are lacking, you know, in terms of human uh, abilities, uh, the resources, what about, you know, the machines that are really aiding and helping and augmenting our, you know, AI is really augmenting our capabilities. That's where I see it, you know, as an opportunity for me to focus maybe on more uh, better oriented things, not just on the data and the raw data or unstructured data. And this is where they are uh, helping out a lot. Yeah, exactly. Thank you so much, Rudy, for these insights. And I like how much you highlighted the fact of how AI is the opportunity for us, how we can utilize it. And like, not just to, because I see a lot of people saying, oh, there's AI to replace me. My, my job will go obsolete. I'm not in an age of learning something new now or whatever other excuses we tell ourselves. But uh, definitely there is always an opportunity. And I think uh, 
whenever AI is combined with domain knowledge, so even if a person is just purely from cybersecurity background, that's not bad. On the contrary, that's good because whenever you have good domain expertise, whenever combined with AI knowledge, then that's that's where the magic happens, I think. So, uh, yeah, that's... Yeah, I just want to add something. In Lebanon, especially in Lebanon, we are known to have many apples. Okay? We don't specialize much in generality. I'm not talking in specifics. And that's, for me, is not the best way to go. You know, if you want to be a cloud engineer or you want to be on, uh, you know, AI, really dive into the AI, know it from A to Z, because you will be that special guy where people will go to. If I hold AI and I hold cloud and I hold whatever, I will understand them, you know. A part of my background, because I'm not really working on day to day in terms of uh, physical, uh, rather I'm more on the strategy side. I have dived into all of this so I can have more of understanding what they are and how they are and how they function. But for specialization, no, you really, I, I really advise people to really dive in into something very specific. Maybe in the beginning they will not know, they need all of this information, but at one point of time, yeah. really dive in and be that go-to person where you will have 10 times, I will repeat, 10 times more chances of you getting jobs than traditional. Yeah, you know, no I totally agree. Because I think we lack experts in the market like uh, people with high expertise in a certain domain. True, true, um, true. Yeah. Thank you so much, Rudy. Um, Hamad, if you can please briefly, just uh, for the sake of time, tell us uh, also your insights in that regard. Well, um, I believe AI over time needs to be just as a skill. So just like you open Word or Excel currently, and you should know that for your current job, you should know how to write a model or run a model, or design a smart bot. This is eventually where all staff or all employees are going to transition into. Uh, as digital transformation occurs, and as smart bots are being developed, and as AI becomes more, um, you know, uh, public domain, in my opinion, AI uh, is shifted from you need to have a PhD and be the top of your class and with a, math a mathematics degree uh, to something that is more on the level of a master's degree and then on a bachelor's and now introduced at the age of 14. And so um, as AI becomes more and more public, it becomes more and more a tool. It's a tool for you to evolve in your business. And so I applaud everyone to go down the road, no matter what, uh, you know, educational background they're in or professional background they're in or anything of that sort. I applaud them to go and dive into AI and understand the concepts and the machine learning. And it has been democratized. Uh, for me, now you can write a model with three lines of code. You really do not need to understand all the details uh, and, um, you know, all the... Uh, intricacies of how you build a machine model, uh, uh, model or how you do machine learning or deep learning or how many nodes or uh, all that stuff is not important as much as understanding which model to use when and how and how do you empower yourself to make decisions in the business world. This is a skill that when added on your CV, whether you are a clerk or a a uh, graphic designer or a content writer or, um, I don't know, in any field or an engineer, computer scientist, in any field is a plus because as things progress, AI is going to be a daily bread and butter for what we do. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And thanks for sharing that because a lot of people, I feel they're still resisting the fact that uh, AI is happening, it actually happened, and we, we cannot really avoid it. We either ride this wave of technological breakthroughs or we're going to stay behind and obsolete in, in the near future. Especially with COVID, like it accelerated this uh, technological yeah. advancement humongously, and we weren't really expecting that. So definitely no one should be scared to, to try to understand AI or learn it. And that's why, why communities like Beirut AI exist, to raise the awareness and to uh, help people learn AI. Exactly. I mean, if, if you just look into Kaggle, uh, where a lot of competitions happen, uh, and I invite everyone to go and check it out, um, you see a lot of models being submitted by a lot of people in AI. Previously, you see universities or big funded people, 
uh, that's before 2014 along those lines. And then you yeah. see a shift or dramatic shift where, you know, a couple of dudes that are 18, 19 years old have state of the art performance on uh, face yeah. recognition yeah. or on uh, t text recognition or on text generation yeah. and, and you're shocked. Uh, and so it has been democratized. You've had so many libraries out there, NumPy, uh, Fast AI. Uh, they simplify the process for you to build uh, machine learning models or deep learning models or understand the concept. All you have to do is really uh, focus on uh, understanding what you want to do, getting your domain expertise and putting that domain expertise in, and then plug it into your system and getting the benefits out of it. Exactly, exactly. Thank you so much, Muhammad, for sharing these insights with us. I think a lot of people would benefit from knowing that. We, they, may, they might need some push to start learning AI, and hopefully now they have, they're encouraged. Just, uh, we have questions. Yeah. Sorry. I just want to add on that. Just uh, even uh, if you look at, uh, sure. do you want to dive into uh, artificial intelligence without building machine learning models? You can. I mean, there are like, like Hamad said, there are models available online uh, on GitHub, or you can gain access to GTP3 if you want, uh, and you can build something on top of that model. So GTP3 is you know natural language processing, right? You can build an application that uses GPT-3 to create whatever you want. For example, I came across uh, an application the other day. Uh, it's a company called uh, Copy.ai. Uh, they they just use GPT-3, and what they did was they just uh, basically uh, allowed you know, small businesses to use uh, their platform to create, uh, to copyright uh, digital marketing, copyright you know, their uh, brand awareness text, the you know, copyright the description of their, of their products. All you have to do is you input something, you input like what you do or what the product is and it generates copy for you. So it's a very simple yeah. apl application of, of, of you know, using uh, machine learning model like GPT-3, but I mean they're very successful. They have, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, growth is amazing. They just raised money, so it doesn't didn't require for that, you know, that team to build, uh, you know, a learning algorithm from scratch. They just use what's available. I mean, uh, uh, OpenAI is what they've done is amazing, and it's it's you know so many companies now are just using their GPT-3. Uh, uh, model to to build so many different applications in regards to natural language processing so you just need to be resourceful and you know find them and and learn about yeah. them and look at their apis and look how, how you can use them everything is yeah. available yeah exactly i really like this idea of like uh, using for example the open ai libraries because a lot of people think if they need to get into ai they need to spare so much time and just to learn ai and i think just being aware of what applications can be used, like what's the capability of AI, what tools exist out there, and the perfect uh, or the good idea of a startup or a company, that's all they need to, to make breakthroughs. And uh, yeah, so thank you for sharing this idea. Yeah. I just I shared the link if anyone wants to check it out on that, on that company I just mentioned. Cool, thank you. Uh, we have some questions in the chat, but for the sake of time, if we can very briefly, please answer them. Uh, so we have someone asking that uh, if, we, if there's anyone with experience into manufacturing and uh, design. Uh, so um, what considerations should I take into account when choosing a problem when it's a field of AI and robotics? So can you give me a kind of a hint based on what should I choose as a problem to solve? Um, is any of the panelists would like to answer this question? Can you can you rephrase that? I, I didn't really understand the question. Yeah, sure. So she's saying if there's someone uh, like maybe she's someone with experience in manufacturing, design, industrial automation, or product text, uh, testing, uh, electronics. Um, so she wants to use robotics and AI this cross field. Um, so she's saying, what are the considerations that she should take into account uh, to choose a problem in these two fields of robotics and AI? So what's the hint that you can give her based on like how she, she can choose a problem? So it seems she doesn't have a problem, but she would like to choose something interesting in that domain, cross-domain. 
She has a lot of problems, but she doesn't know it. <laughs> exactly. Um, I, I'd like to give it a shot. Um, I'll, I'll give her one advice. Ask. Meet people. Go to people and uh, factories and sit with them and find problems. There's a lot of problems in manufacturing. There's a lot of problems in that kind of sector. For sure, I come from a background of manufacturing. I was involved in Encrypt where we manufacture SIM cards, smart cards throughout the uh, uh, whole MENA region. And so um, you might think it's a problem and then, or a, you've got a solution, but you go down and then you meet on the ground with real people who interact on a daily basis with manufacturing and with these machines, and they will have a whole story. Uh, and so my advice to you uh, would be go and try to meet with people in that field, in that industry, and see what is their major pay points and try to solve it for them. That's the best way to create something that would be uh, meaningful, useful, and that you could develop on top of uh, for the future. Yeah, just let me add, yeah, yeah, exactly. uh, you put a great point, uh, Muhammad, and I just want to add from my knowledge that first, the industrial, uh, you know, machines or machinery are all following old technologies, okay, other than, you know, new manufacturing, this is something different. Uh, try to see and work on uh, IoT and uh, AI, uh, that combination, because IoT now can be integrated is integrated heavily in the machinery, so they can know exactly what's happening at every point. Uh, a second, if you are talking about robotics, I assume also you want you know automation and robotic uh, uh, and robotization of um, product manufacturing and so on. So that's a problem, you know, which I think rarely anybody in this region has uh, done anything. And then we we see the leading things in the world are the car manufacturers and and so on. So. Uh, other than the normal automations uh, we need. So, a big uh, part of this field is preventive maintenance. And so, uh, uh, IT is a big exactly, preventive maintenance. I, I know for us, she can come to Encrypt and uh, we'd love to open the doors <laughs> if she wants to go into that field. Uh, it's a headache for all manufacturers everywhere to be able to schedule uh, preventive maintenance and make sure that they don't lose heavy equipment that usually costs two to three million dollars and manufacturing runs uh, and downtime. So this is a big uh, aspect in the field that she can go and try to tackle. Yeah. Nice. Nice. That's very interesting. Thank you for sharing the ideas. And maybe uh, she can contact uh, like the speakers. Anytime. Mind. And thank you for that. Um, okay. So we also, Muhammad, uh, have another question addressed to you. What are the ethical issues regarding the digital marketing sector? But please briefly, if possible. Um, uh, so, um, well, technically speaking, since we know the data of people, we can target those people uh, and we can target their emotions and their impulse buying. And this is a big deal, right? Uh, it does not take into account whether those people are financially okay to buy or they're financially ready for a step like that, but we can use sentiment and we can use information that we've acquired uh, over these people in order to create an impulse buy. Uh, that may not be in their financial best interest. And so, yes, that raises a big ethical question, whether you should do that type of marketing or target that type of people or do, um, you know, uh, narrow your target market in such a way based on individual insights and individual information. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and yes, this opens up a whole big ethical field uh, of what information to use, what information not to use, how do you target people, and do you really push people uh, against their impulses? Yeah, exactly. And I think um, it's very, very important to raise awareness on this because at many times we just see a Facebook ad or whatever social media, and we think, okay, we're just browsing through these suggestions and ads, but we're not aware that they're targeting us specifically because of certain reasons and 
playing with the like to the emotions part maybe to to let us buy something and uh, we're totally unaware or maybe for political reasons or nothing is haphazard you talk about yeah. something yeah. with a friend next to your phone the next thing you see on that exactly. instagram feed or facebook feed is what you're we talking about uh, and exactly. so we, we all know this is used against us we we should be aware of it as human beings and never put ourselves at jeopardy Uh, and understand that yes this is beneficial because i was talking about that and it opens the door for me to see it but to be in control and aware of ourselves and not go into impulse buying or you know yeah. uh, uh into polarization which is, is another big issue that's in the states right now ethically where we've seen how facebook polarized the elections uh when trump uh with had been presidency and so all these big ethical issues uh, are huge and honestly not debated in the mina region uh right now we're dabbling with with ai and technology you feel people are not really maybe not aware or not concerned about it or maybe not they concerned. don't know how um, yeah it's it's uh, it's a cultural thing so for example if you take europe uh, if you travel and you put your passport uh the com- the the country is not allowed to register the fact that you traveled out or into the country that's part of gdpr that's compliance that's your right not to have data about if you're traveling or leaving a country or coming back and when and where that's not for the state to know uh but we come from regimes or we come from countries where they know if we leave the house and so it's a cultural issue and it's just cultural awareness more than it is uh you know exactly. uh, something that's tech related. Yeah. I think it all starts with cultural awareness. Correct. Um, so yeah. Thank you so and re- much. Uh, and regulation, yeah. you need regulation. Like GDPR is a regulation yeah. that that the European Union kind of agreed on yeah. implementing and they're finding, you know, companies left and right uh, that, you know, kind of uh, don't uh, comply with it. And uh, I think the US is on track to do the same now. We have uh, CCPA, the California one. It's even stricter than GDPR. So regulation is a big start honestly in any country uh, I think in in the, in the Emirates regulation is very strict as well in terms of uh, data privacy so for me it starts with uh, with regulation on on government level Yeah and I think maybe in other countries like uh, if the regulations don't exist but people are aware maybe they can push for these regulations so uh, they thought the European <laughs> it wasn't given for free uh I'll tell you that it, it was a yeah, push yeah. from the people uh to get that uh you know up and running uh, and that legislation uh was developed over a long period of time it wasn't uh you know a shortcoming that just came up uh in in days or weeks or months um and so yes people pushed for it and so we need to raise awareness as well to push for more legislation uh to help us exactly. uh, in fighting this issue yeah definitely Um okay thank you so much there are yeah. other questions maybe uh they could be asked in the networking session so please everyone uh, stay for that session and thank you so much for our speakers it was very interesting discussions and i think um, it's very important to raise awareness on this topic especially now in the digital transformation age so thank you for sharing all these insights and Absolutely. i hope uh, also others enjoyed this as we did likewise likewise it was a great uh, session and uh, hopefully you know things come out of uh, as a recommendation also